Matthew 27, if you have your Bibles, we're going to pick up in around verse 51. Uh, my daughter wanted me to remind you that there is a Sunday school and nursery if you need to take your children in there. Uh, that's always a great place um, for them to learn and grow in their relationship with the Lord. And so uh, we left off, as I mentioned, on Good Friday with Jesus dying on the cross dying for our sins, and yet as he was on the cross, he continued to bless, forgive, and save those that had treated him so horribly. Um, as you look at those short sayings, he said from the cross, it demonstrates his love, his compassion, his grace and mercy, as he again fulfilled the whole purpose for him coming from heaven to earth. Uh, the first thing Jesus said when they lifted him up on the cross was, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. What a statement from the one who was beaten and tortured and nails driven into his hands and feet as he's looking down at those who were mocking him and who had brutalized him, the soldiers that had just driven those nails into his hands and feet. He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. A short time later, there was two thieves being crucified with Jesus. And they were mocking him initially, but I think when the one thief started listening to Jesus forgive them, you mean we can be forgiven? I mean, this is amazing. You can be forgiven? I'm hanging on a cross. I'm getting what I deserve because I've sinned. I, I'm a rebel. Um, he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly today you will be with me in paradise amazing. Again, from the cross, he, he saves this guy that was destined for hell, and now he's going to go into paradise. He would end up in heaven because of the grace of the Lord. Shortly after that, he made arrangements for his mother to be taken care of, as, as she is probably just grieving, watching her only begotten son being crucified on the cross. Uh, not her only begotten son, uh, her firstborn son. They had about five or six others after Jesus. But Jesus, you know, says to his mother, behold your son, speaking of John, the, the apostle, and then John, behold your mother. Then the final four statements of Christ from the cross is shortly uh, before he dies. It says from noon to three, it was darkness over the whole land as God was pouring out his judgment, his wrath upon Jesus for our sins. And so Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he was becoming sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then he says, I thirst. And then he yells out, I, uh, it is finished, which simply means the price has been paid in full for all of our sins. When he says it is finished, to tell us die in the Greek simply means paid in full. The reason he came from heaven to earth to die on the cross for our sins was to pay the price for the sins of the world. And he did it because of his grace, his mercy, his love for us. And then the last thing he says was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And as the end of verse 50 says here in Matthew uh, chapter 27, it says, Then Jesus yielded up his spirit. In other words, they didn't kill Jesus, but Jesus willingly died. He willingly gave himself for us. Jesus describes it like this earlier in his ministry in John 10. Look at these verses, starting in verse 17. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And so once again, Jesus was not a victim in all of this. He was in control. So now as we come into uh, chapter 27, verse 51, we continue on in this narrative. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, who died, were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, the main thing to notice here was as soon as he died, it was at 3 p.m., 3 p.m. in the afternoon was when the sacrificial lamb was killed and then the blood would be sprinkled on the altar, the, the, the um, Ark of the Covenant, 
in the Holy of Holies. And at that moment, as the high priest is sprinkling the blood on the uh, Ark of the Covenant, that is when the temple veil rips in two from top to bottom. And this was a, a huge ordeal. I mean, the temple veil, only the high priest, only once a year could go through that veil and pour out the blood. And it was at that time when Jesus tore the veil in two from top to bottom. King Herod's temple had a veil that was 80 feet high, approximately six inches thick. So don't think of some little wedding veil that was torn, but it was torn in two from top to bottom. In other words, God himself reached down and he tore that veil in two because that veil is what separated holy God and the Holy of Holies from sinful human beings like us. And Jesus, ripping that, having that veil ripped in two, God is saying, okay, everyone now can come into my presence. Everyone now can enter into a relationship with me because of the sacrifice of my son, Jesus Christ. It was glorious. And so at that moment when Jesus died, it says there was an earthquake, rock split in two, the sound of uh, that 80-foot curtain being torn, it must have made a huge sound, uh, we're told that many, many priests were working in the Temple Mount during the time of Passover, and I'm sure they heard that veil. It wouldn't be just a little rip. I mean, it would have been <laughs> as God rips it in two, because we know many of those priests got saved. This is what we read in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many priests were obedient to the faith. And so from that moment on, God no longer recognized the Jewish sacrificial system that he had established with his people, and that's because Jesus is the final sacrificial lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was the one who fulfilled all the law and all the prophets. Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 7 says it like this, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. Speaking of the Old Testament, it is written of me to do your will, O God. And so what a remarkable thing that Jesus accomplished for all of us on the cross. The sacrificial system is once and for all fulfilled. Every lamb that was slaughtered prior to Jesus was looking forward to his sacrifice for sin. The veil is torn in two. It's removed once and for all. And so we don't need any priest. We don't need any mediator. We don't need any pastor to try and stand between us and the Lord. We go directly to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is now the veil that we go through, and then we can come into the presence of God. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Again, we don't need anyone to get in the way. We have direct access to the Father. Jesus is our high priest, and because of this, Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now look at verse 54 in your Bibles. It says, So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joseph the mother of Zebedee's sons. And so the centurion and those with him, when they hear the, feel the earthquake, uh, you know, they probably even heard maybe the temple ripping, but all these things are taking place. They had been mocking Jesus. The sky was dark for three hours, and then all of a sudden Jesus dies, says, it is finished, into your hands I commit my spirit, and they exclaim, surely this was the Son of God. How could you not be impacted by what these guys are seeing? I've always wondered if we're going to see any of these Roman soldiers that were around the cross. Are we going to see them in heaven? 
I mean, they exclaim here, truly this was the Son of God. Were they saved later on? We're not sure. Now, in between verses 56 and 57, the Apostle John gives us some very interesting details. It was the preparation day. Uh, the next day, it says, was a high Sabbath. The Jewish leaders asked Pilate to have the legs of these three criminals, in their minds, they were criminals, broken. And so they wanted to break their legs. Why? Because they wanted them to suffocate quickly. They wanted them off the crosses before Passover. And that was their motive. We don't want these guys hanging around over the weekend and during Passover and then the first part of unleavened bread because sometimes people on crosses would last for days. And so to speed it up, they would break their legs and then they would quickly suffocate. Isn't this lovely topic before lunch? So... Pilate says, okay, you can break their legs. So it says uh, the soldiers took their clubs, they break the legs of the two thieves, and then they come to Jesus, and when they realize he's already dead, one of the soldiers takes his spear, throws it up into his rib cage, probably into his heart. It says, out poured blood and water. So that spear went into the sack around the heart, into the heart itself, and this is what we read in John 19, verse 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side and with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. The point is, Jesus is as dead as you can be. He didn't faint. He didn't swoon. He was dead. He'd given up the ghost, so to speak. He was gone. So look at verse 57 back here in Matthew 27. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself also be had become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. So again, when you look at all the other Gospels, we're given some wonderful details about this man, Joseph of Arimathea. We're told that he was a very rich man. History says that he was one of the most wealthy men in Jerusalem at that time. He was part of the Sanhedrin, which is the rulers of the Jewish people. Mark tells us that he was waiting for the kingdom of God. And so something was ministering to him. The Holy Spirit was ministering to him. And so he was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he says he was very honorable, very prominent member of the Sanhedrin. We're told in the other Gospels that he was a good and righteous man who was one of the few religious leaders who refused to condemn Jesus. All the others, there were 70 in that Sanhedrin, 68 of them condemned Jesus to death. Only two did not. And so it's with boldness that he goes to Pontius Pilate he asked for the body of Jesus to be given to him so he can give him a proper burial. Now, it's in John's gospel that we read about Joseph being a secret disciple of Jesus. And that was because he was afraid. He was afraid of the other people, the other religious leaders. He didn't like that kind of peer pressure. Maybe some of you are secret disciples of Jesus. You don't like people picking on you for being a Christian, so you be quiet about it. Well, we're going to see that didn't last very long with Joseph of Arimathea. Not anymore. He was not ashamed to be identified with Jesus Christ any longer. So he goes, he gets the body of Jesus. And what would they do with the, the criminals that were crucified? Usually they would take them down off the crosses. They would throw them in the Valley of Hinnom which is just, in, just outside the Kidron Valley there in Jerusalem, it was their trash dump. And they would throw the crucified bodies in there so that they'd be eaten up by the wild animals and the birds. He did not want to see that happen to Jesus. That's his only reason for going to Pontius Pilate and saying, I would like to take the body, give him a proper burial. And so we're also introduced in John's Gospel to another teacher that his name is Nicodemus. Nick at night. Remember Nicodemus? He's the one that came secretly to Jesus. And Jesus tells him, you must be born again. 
Well, he's one of the disciples of Jesus as well. He came to know the Lord. And so here's these two very prominent Jewish religious leaders. They take it upon themselves to, by themselves, take the body of Jesus down from the cross. What a task that would be. I mean, they're having to pound the nails back out of his hands, out of his feet. Here's his bruised, bloody, beaten Jesus. They take his limp body down, and then they carry him over to the tomb. And we're told that this was a tomb of Joseph's. That was a new tomb. It was carved out of solid rock. And so they carefully remove the crown of thorns from his head, probably pull out the little pieces of thorns that may have broken off as they were striking him on the head as they beat Jesus. It was horrible, but they meticulously wash his body as the Jewish burial custom was. They wrap his body in linen clothes. This was known as the takrahim. The takrahim is what the Jews would often do with those who had died. It was about a 14-foot long cloth, and it was about four feet wide. They would lay it out they would put the body with the head in the middle. They'd pull it back over him. So it was over the front of him, went down the back of him as he's laying there. Then they would tie up his ankles. They would tie up his knees. They would put, uh, his hands would be tied. They would close his jaw. They would tie that up. And then they would put a covering over his head. So this is what they've done with the body of Jesus. Don't picture Jesus being wrapped up like a mummy. He was not. That was the Egyptian way of doing it. But this was the Jewish way of doing it. And the point was, they would leave the body in a tomb for two years and let it disintegrate. And then once they would come back after two years, they would take the bones, the largest bone, and they put it in an ossuary. It was called a bone box. And they would put those in there, and they'd fold them in there, and then they would cover it up, and then they would stick it in another tomb with a lot of other ossuaries. So that's what they're thinking. We're just going to put him in this tomb, and we'll come back in a couple years, and then we will bury him, you know, once again. But Jesus only needed his tomb for the weekend. It was just a short deal. Now, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they would lose everything they owned. They would lose their prominence in the society. They would lose their position on the Sanhedrin. They would be shunned by all of their friends and colleagues, all because they came to Jesus. And now they're no longer uh, ashamed to be identified as one of his followers. What a great lesson for all of us. You should not be ashamed to be identified with Jesus. After all, he loves you. He died for you. He demonstrated his love for us going to the cross while we were still in our sins. So why would we be ashamed of him? I mean, we should live for him. They were doing this for a dead Jesus. How much more should we live for the risen Jesus? Now, we're also told that this tomb was a new tomb that was Joseph's tomb, hewn or chiseled out of solid rock. Nobody had ever been in this tomb before. And uh, again, Jesus would only be in here for a few days. And after they laid Jesus' body in his tomb, they rolled this. It's about a two-ton stone. They roll it in front. And um, let's put those pictures up. This is Gordon's tomb, also called the Garden Tomb there in Jerusalem, just outside the old city walls of Jerusalem. And this, I believe, could be the actual tomb of Jesus. Go to the next one. This is inside the tomb and so they would lay his body there. I mean, that's just carved out of solid rock. And then the last one, um, well, that's not the last one, is it? There's the last one. So you can see that curb that kind of runs along it. That curb is actually where the stone would sit inside there. It would drop inside, and they would roll it, and you can't really see. There's a stopper there, and the stone would stop when it hit that stopper. It was rolling downhill. So it was very, very difficult once it was in place to roll it back out. It took quite a few men to move that stone. So be that as it may, that would be similar to what, where Jesus was buried. Now, look at verse 62 back here in Matthew's gospel. It says, On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days, I will rise. See, even they knew what Jesus was talking about. Three days, I will rise. Many times he told his disciples, I'm going to be uh, beaten up, crucified, but on the third day I'm going to rise again, and it just went right over their heads. These guys 
They took it seriously. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So he says, you have a guard. Uh, the word guard here is custodia, and th these were the most elite soldiers in the Roman Empire. They were trained in all kinds of warfare. Um, there's 16 in a guard, and so he says, you have these 16 elite soldiers, use them, make this tomb as secure as you know how, and they're giving the, the greatest proof for the resurrection of Jesus. Because if anybody got close to this tomb, they would put them to death. They didn't mess around. And so here's these 16 elite soldiers, brave men, guarding the tomb so nobody can come and steal the body away. Look at chapter 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, that's Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Now we're told it's in Mark's gospel that these women were bringing spices. They wanted to anoint the body of Jesus. They were not sure how in the world are we going to roll this giant stone away, but we'll figure it out when we get there. And so they wanted to anoint his body for burial. Now, they had watched where Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had placed his body within the tomb, but they were not aware of the fact that these guards were there. They had no idea. So when they show up, this is a surprise. There's guards here, but there's a bigger surprise awaiting them. If they knew these guards were there, they would not have gone. They couldn't. They wouldn't. They would have been killed. Yet God had it all prearranged. God knew this, and so he sent an angel and an earthquake ahead of time. Look at verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And so again, here these elite soldiers train for all kinds of battles, and they are fearful. They are scared out of their minds. This angel, he descends. It says there's a massive earthquake. The word massive here is in the Greek is mega. We know that word, mega earthquake. This isn't a little rumbling like you get out in Southern California. I grew up out there and you like earthquakes all the time. It's like, yeah, there's another one. I mean, this thing was shaking the place. This thing shook their minds. They were fearful. Here's this angel that descends and he's just sitting there on top of the tombstone. Now, this stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. He's already risen. This stone was rolled away to let people in, to see that he is not there. And so, these soldiers are terrified for a couple of reasons. Obviously, they're stunned by this angel. They're stunned by the earthquake. But they're also terrified because there's no body to guard. The, the body they were guarding is missing. And so that means they could be put to death. These soldiers had a responsibility. Uh, King Herod Agrippa, when, remember when Peter in Acts chapter 12, he gets arrested. He gets thrown in jail. It says he had guards there at the jail, and this angel came at night and opened the door, and Peter and him just walk out. Peter thought he was dreaming until he gets outside. Well, later on, when King Herod Agrippa hears about Peter escaping, all those soldiers guarding him were put to death. So these guys are terrified knowing we're going to be put to death. Now, from the other Gospels, we know that the women were wondering, how are we going to roll this stone away? It's a two-ton stone. We can't do this. And so when they walk up on the scene, they're just marveling. They're stunned themselves. Look at verse 5. It says, But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Hallelujah. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. So here you seek Jesus who was crucified. 
but he is risen. And with those simple words, that is the gospel. That's the gospel message. Jesus died and he rose again. Without the resurrection, Paul says, we are of all people most to be pitied. Without the resurrection, we're wasting our time studying the Bible. Without the resurrection, we have no hope, Paul says. Peter says we have a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's only because he's alive that we have that hope that when we die, we're going to see him in glory. We're going to go home to be with him. If you don't have that hope this morning, you need to get right with God. He demonstrated his love for you. He died in your place and he rose from the dead to give you eternal life. But it's up to you to receive his forgiveness. He won't force you into the kingdom of heaven, but he is willingly here right now, willing to save you and forgive you of all of your sins. But this again is a fulfillment of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was crucified for us. He paid the price to redeem us to save us, and to give us eternal life. But again, none of that is possible without the resurrection. And so this is the gospel, the good news. This is why the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most important doctrine there is in the Bible. This is the most important biblical truth there is. Our eternal salvation hinges on this truth. Paul says it like this in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of of God to salvation to anyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For anybody, but you have to believe. It's the good news. It's the power. There is no other way of salvation. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can say, well, I'm religious. Doesn't matter. You can say, well, I've go, I go to church every Christmas and Easter. Doesn't matter. You can say, I go to church every Sunday. Doesn't matter. Well, I read my Bible. Doesn't matter. I pray. Doesn't matter who you're praying to. If you're not born again, you're not going to go to heaven. Jesus is the only way, truth, and life. You have to come to the Father through Jesus Christ. This is good news. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul says it like this. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. So when you want to know what is the gospel, here it is. Which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by also which you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Here it is, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Again, there's many, many Old Testament Scriptures that talked about the Messiah being put to death. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and many others where he had to die. And that he was buried, that's what we just looked at, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. In fact, the biblical gospel of Jesus Christ is so simple and straightforward and true and powerful that the Apostle Paul says very clearly in um, Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven, I can think of one phony Maroni, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. There is only one genuine gospel message that leads to salvation. Again, Jesus paid the price for our sins completely. His blood can wash away all of our sins. I love that. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what I did. It doesn't matter what sins you've committed. God is ready, willing, and able to forgive you and give you a brand new start. That is how much he loves you. That is how much he cares for you. And so that means it's not by any good works that we could ever do that would contribute to our salvation, but it's by God's grace alone. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. That's why I mentioned going to church, reading your Bible. Those, those things are good, but that's not going to save you. You're only saved by putting your faith alone in Christ alone. We receive the free gift of salvation that he offers. And, what's, and it's when we place our faith in Jesus Christ alone that God gives us his very own righteousness. Think about that. How are you made righteous? Not by your good deeds, not by being here, 
but it's by faith in Christ. And he gives you his righteousness. In and of ourselves, my righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. But in Christ, we are new creations. Jesus did everything for our salvation. If it was up to me to do good works to earn salvation or do good works to maintain my salvation, I would be toast. And so would you. We can't do it. You have to obey the law 100% of the time. And the Bible is very clear. There's none righteous. No, not one. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. In James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For whoever shall keep the whole law, I'm going to try real hard this week to keep the Ten Commandments, and yet you stumble in one point. He is guilty of all. And so, again, the law cannot save you, but the law shows you how perfect God is, how much we have failed. It was not given to save us, but to show us that we need a Savior. The Bible is very clear that no one can live up to the perfect standards of God's law, no one but Jesus. Jesus fulfilled every, the Bible says, every jot and tittle of the law. That means every little comma, you might think, every little, pe you know, uh, period, every little part of the Hebrew language, Jesus fulfilled every bit of it, every single ounce of the law he fulfilled completely and perfectly and because he fulfilled the law and now if you're saved you're in Christ so the law has been fulfilled in you and you can rest in that fact you can rest that Jesus paid the price in full and again it's because we are in Christ that all of God's laws are fulfilled within us we are declared righteous in God's eyes, and it's not by any good works we could ever do, but it's because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. That's why your sins are forgiven. That's why, because of his resurrection, you can go to heaven. It's that simple. We will spend eternity in the presence of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 7. It says, and go quickly. This is what the angel tells the, the women here. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. So they're just running from the tomb as fast as they can back to the house where Peter and the other disciples are hiding in fear. And they're going to tell them the good news, Jesus is alive, risen from the dead. Verse 9 says, And as he went to tell his disciples, Behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my, uh, tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So as they're running home, to tell the other, Jesus just steps out in front of them, and they come screeching to a halt. And they're just like, wow, here's Jesus. He's alive. And he simply says, rejoice. That's all he had to say. And they instantly knew their Savior's voice. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Now, they fall down. They, they worship him. And notice they held on to his feet. This is Jesus in his resurrection body. As they're holding on to his feet, they're probably seeing the holes from the nail that went through his feet. Later, he'll tell Thomas, put your finger here in the holes in my hands. Put the, your hand in the hole on my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believe. But he says, go and tell my brethren. Take note of that phrase, my brethren. Yeah, my brethren, those guys that ran away from me, those guys that promised, I'll never deny you, Lord. Even if these others deny, I won't. And they all did. They all fled. They're all hiding in fear and shame. And Jesus still looks at them and says, my brethren. Isn't that amazing? That's how Jesus looks at you today. You are his brethren. You are his brothers and sisters. None of us are perfect brethren, we still stumble, we still make mistakes, we still fall short, but we are Jesus' brethren. So never lose sight of that, because the enemy is going to come along and say, God doesn't love you, you blew it again, you had this thought, you should not even try, just give up. 
But Jesus says, no, don't give up. You're my brethren. I love you. And I'm not done with any of you yet. Don't ever forget Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will complete it. When? The day of Jesus Christ. I'm not completed yet. This guy's not completed yet. David. <laughs> He's oblivious. None of us are completed yet. We're complete in Christ, but none of us are finished. He's still working on us. And so don't ever lose the, the sight of the fact that he who began that good work, he will, he, he will finish it. He's, he's going to complete it. And I'm looking forward to that day when I stand before him in glory. Now look at verse 11. It says, Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ear, to Pontius Pilate, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this thing is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So some of these soldiers, they come to the religious leaders. They don't go to their commanding officers. They don't go to Pontius Pilate. Why? Because they would have been put to death. So they go to the religious leaders. And these guys, they know the truth. An angel came down. There was an earthquake. The, he, the stone was rolled away. But they don't want the truth to come out. And so these religious leaders, they make this lie up. They fabricate this falsehood. Um, it sounds like our government. It sounds like our media. I mean, it's hard to know what is true and what is false. We know from the Bible. That's what you got to lean on. You can watch CNN, you can watch Fox News all you want, and you're going to get a distorted view of something. They're going to spin it. These guys are spinning it. So nothing new under the sun. They fabricate this lie. Oh, yeah, just tell them, you know, the disciples came and overpowered these 16 elite soldiers, and they rolled away the stone, and they stole the body. All they had to do was just show the body, and then they could have dismissed it, but the body is gone because Jesus rose. Then, look at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee. So this really skips way far into the future here. This is the shortest gospel presentation of the resurrection in Matthew's gospel. So they went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Some doubted. It doesn't mean that they didn't believe in the resurrection because Jesus is standing right there in front of them, but it simply means that when... Um, they saw him, they were still blown away. They're still afraid. It's the same word doubted that was used when Jesus said to Peter, come on, walk on the water. And he said he started walking on the water and then he became afraid. He started to sing. Jesus pulls him up, puts him in the boat. And then he says, why did you doubt? That's the same word used here. Don't be doubting, you know. Be fully convinced. When Pentecost came, all their fears would be turned into faith. Great faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, this is known as the Great Commission. How can we be part of the Great Commission today? By understanding all power, all authority has been given to Jesus. And it's in His power that He sends you and I out into this world to represent Him, to be ambassadors for Christ, to be His disciples, to shine the light, to be salt, that's what he's called us to do. It's not in our own power. It's not in our own strength. It's not like, okay, Lord, I'm going to try to suck it up today and I'm going to try real hard to live for you. You're going to fail. It's like, no, Lord, I can't do anything. Apart from you, I can do nothing. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus tells us the source of his power 
in his final words to these disciples just before he ascends back up into heaven. We'll close in these verses. Look at Luke 24, 46. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and this is right before he ascends. This is so, again, Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared to his disciples for 40 days, giving them great proofs of the resurrection, but also teaching them. And this is one of the last things he told them. Thus, it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. What is that? Suffer, rise again, the gospel, right? That's the gospel. He died for our sins. He rose again. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The very last thing he says before he ascends, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I want to leave you with this. As we are here today, we hear the gospel, the good news. He has given us the gospel to share with others. So we need to, as he says, go, make disciples, baptize them. Where do we go? Well, how about your next door neighbor? Where do we go? Well, here in Grand Junction, there's always opportunities. I know a lot of you witness to people all the time. Where else do we go? Well, Colorado. This is our Jerusalem. Colorado's our Judea. He says, Samaria, go to wherever God sends you in this United States to the end of the earth. That's why we have teams all over the place in Northeast India and in Africa. I mean, God is doing a great work all over the place, so we need to go. And what do we do when we go? Well, we make disciples. In other words, we lead them to Christ because he alone can save them. And then we baptize, not for salvation, but to identify them with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's what baptism is, signifies. And then we teach them the word of God. We teach them for growth, for equipping, and then for going. It's just an ongoing cycle. We just keep telling people about the Lord. Here we are 2,000 years later, and we're still doing the same things Jesus told us to do. Praise the Lord. It's awesome because God is not done with any of us yet. And if you feel weak, you feel tired, now's the time to say, okay, Lord, maybe I need to be refilled with your spirit. I'm running on empty. I'm running on fumes. And so I need to humble myself and say, Lord, refill me. Paul simply says in Ephesians 5.18, don't get wasted. Don't get drunk with wine, which is wastefulness, dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. He's telling that to the church in Ephesus. They're born again. They got the Spirit in them. But he said, no, you need to be filled up. And as you go through the book of Acts, you see these disciples getting filled and refilled constantly because we're not always chipper. We're not always like, yay, I'm not. And so we ask the Lord, Lord, refill me. Use me for your glory because apart from you, I can do nothing. And never forget the very last thing Jesus says here in Matthew 28, verse 20 is I am with you always to the end of the age. That's the only reason you can make it through victoriously in your Christian walk, because Jesus is with you. He's given you the Holy Spirit, and we can have victory in Christ. Amen?